of my mom because she goes to work and also buys the food for us in the locker. I die. Mommy, dad, I love mommy because she lets us play the way. I love mama because she helps people who are sick. She gives us some fruit, which is apples. I love mommy because she makes um, yummy food and she takes us for cycle rides and she makes us make hearts sometimes. We love mama our mum because, because she cooks for us. Come on, the people, she gets me treats. Because she gives us hugs and, and she lets us go outside. And because she is our boss. Trees. I love my mum because she's generous and she's kind. Thanks mum for uh, always praying for us and for always um, being there for us and having our back. Kill me. I love my mum because she gives me stuff and she loves me back. I love my mum because she's feisty and funny. And because she doesn't always put me in time out lots of times and I love her. She's the best. Thank you for loving me so well throughout the years, so consistently. Thank you for praying for me. And I love that you're willing to learn new things. I love that you're uh, so adaptable and we have great laughs together. I love my mum because she listens to the good the bad and the ugly and she never gets tired of listening and even when she does she pretends not to so she doesn't hurt my feelings i love you mum my mum is the best and uh, she always uh, looks after me in a series she um always helps me with homework and a series with his diapers uh yeah so thank you nana Thank you. I love my mom because she gives me hugs and kisses. I love my mom because she's my best friend. She is so loving, so kind and so caring. My mom shows love through so many different ways, whether it's baking for the worship team or just going out of her comfort zone to help someone out. My mom is so selfless and so humble, it's actually amazing. So thank you, Mum. Thank you for loving me, and thank you for making me the person that I am today. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. I want to say a huge thank you to all the incredible mums from our church who have been mum to me over the years. Thank you so much for all the prayer, the love, and the baking. We love you, and we honour you. Happy Mother's Day. I die. Mummy. I love mommy because she lets us play the way. I love mama because she helps people who are sick. She gives us some fruit, which is apples. I love mommy because she makes um, yummy food and she takes us for cycle rides and she makes us make hearts sometimes. We love our mum because, because she cooks, cooks for us. us. Come on, the people. She gets me treats. Because she gives us hugs and, and she lets us go outside. And because she is our boss. Treats. I love my mum because she's generous and she's kind. Thanks mum for uh, always praying for us and for always um, being there for us and having our back. Kill me. Kill me. I love my mum because she gives me stuff and she loves me back. I love my mum because she's feisty and funny. And because she doesn't always put me in time out lots of times and I love her. She's the best. Thank you for loving me so well throughout the years, so consistently. Thank you for praying for me. And I love that you're willing to learn new things. I love that you're uh, so adaptable and we have great laughs together. I love my mum because she listens to the good, the bad and the ugly. And she never gets tired of listening. And even when she does, she pretends not to so she doesn't hurt my feelings. I love you mum. Yeah. My mum is the best and uh, 
she always uh, looks after me in a series. She um, always helps me with the homework and a series with his diapers. Uh, yeah. Say thank you, Nana. Thank you, Nana. Thank you. I love my mom because she gives me hug and kisses. I love my mum because she's my best friend. She is so loving, so kind and so caring. My mum shows love through so many different ways, whether it's baking for the worship team or just going out of her comfort zone to help someone out. My mum is so selfless and so humble, it's actually amazing. So thank you mum. Thank you for loving me and thank you for making me the person that I am today. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. I want to say a huge thank you to all the incredible mums from our church who have been mum to me over the years. Thank you so much for all the prayer, the love and the baking. We love you and we honour you. Happy Mother's Day. No my heart and my welcome to online church this morning. We're so glad you can join us. My name is Mark. And my name is Carista. We love connecting with those who connect with us here on the internet. So if you want to get in contact with us, please jump over to our website, get in contact with us, or hit us up on social media. But you could also connect with us in person at one of our in-person services, which happen at 67 Harrow Street in Dunedin. Yeah, so glad. Let's, let's get, jump into the message. Kia ora koutou koutou. it is great to be with you. My name is Adam Dodds, I am the teaching pastor here at the Elam Church in Dunedin and thank you for opening up your home or wherever it is you are watching this and it's my privilege to bring the word today and I've entitled today's message The Secret to the Blessed Life. Of course there's more than one secret but this is the entry into the blessed life and if you lock into this it then opens up everything else. Now, you know that Labour and National and the Green Party and the ACT Party and others put out their election manifestos. But have you ever wondered what it would look like if Jesus put out his own manifesto? Well, he did. And it's called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus talked and it was in an elevated place. And you read it in Matthew 5, 6 and 7. But what's interesting about Jesus' manifesto is it is so countercultural that I definitely don't think he would get elected in New Zealand or anywhere else for that matter. But let me just refresh our memories before we get into Matthew chapter 5. Just prior to this, Jesus comes, you know, this God man declares the kingdom of God is at hand. God is encountering you through me right now, Jesus is saying. He then calls some disciples and they start to follow him. Then crowds start to follow him. And, and so then uh, Matthew 5, 6 and 7, this Sermon on the Mount, is really a kind of description by Jesus to his disciples of what following him looks like, of what the Christian life looks like, of what being disciples of Jesus looks like. And within this kind of election manifesto, if you like, this description of what being a follower of Jesus looks like, there's some quite bizarre things, some quite unusual and some definitely radical things. Jesus says, God's rule and authority belongs to the poor in spirit, not to the strong and influential. Jesus says those who will end up in charge of the planet are not the powerful, uh, but those who are gentle and humble, not those who engage in marketing campaigns. Jesus says, don't threaten your enemies. Don't get mad at them. Don't sue them. Seek their highest good. Go out of your way to give them gifts. Those who are mourning are happy. And the insulted, well, they're happy too. Now, as you can see, this is, this is unusual stuff. And so within that, there's actually the secret to the blessed life and the entry level into the blessed life. It's clear that Jesus is not just a nice religious teacher telling other people to be nice to each other. Jesus' teachings are actually revolutionary. And so this is his manifesto of the kingdom. Matthew 5 verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Well, the mountain most likely was the steeply rising ground to the west of Lake Galilee or the Sea of Galilee. And there are kind of concave slopes uh, which became a sounding board um, in relation to the lake. And all of that provided good acoustics for Jesus to speak to large numbers of people. Verse 3. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And it's those verses I want to look at for our time today. What Jesus is saying is, those who live a particular way are blessed. Well, what does blessed mean? It means someone is to be congratulated. If someone's blessed, they are to be congratulated. It means that um, their place in life is an enviable one. You could also say they are fortunate or they are well off. That's what blessed means. I am now 41 years old. I know I don't look a day above 25, but that's okay. Uh, but a long time ago, uh, when I was 17, I remember feeling this strong uh, emptiness and discontentment in my heart. I, I remember um, feeling this emptiness and trying to fill it in many different ways. I tried to fill it through various activities, uh, not all of which were legal. Um, and, and some of them kind of gave me a boost temporarily, but overall there was just this, uh, I would now use the language, existential kind of uh, gap on the inside of me. There was something inside that just wasn't right. I was feeling an emptiness, a discontentment, a lack of peace, and I wasn't happy. There was something wrong. And I think you could say that I was beginning to recognize that I was poor in spirit. I think that's part of what being poor in spirit means. And the good news to me in that situation, and maybe it's to you in your situation too, is Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. And I was starting to feel that on the inside of me. Theologian John Calvin says, he only who is reduced to nothing in himself and relies on the mercy of God is poor in spirit. Now, the background for understanding the New Testament is the Old Testament. And so uh, in the Old Testament, poverty initially simply meant those who were economically poor. But over time, it came to have spiritual overtones and it came to then convey and, and kind of um, communicate though, those who are humble and totally dependent upon God. And so by the time you get to the New Testament, being poor in spirit is not primarily being poor economically, uh, but actually being poor in spirit is a positive spiritual description. Those who are poor in spirit are empty before God. Those who are poor in spirit are empty before God. Are you facing a situation in your life at the moment where you're feeling out of depth? Are you out of your depth? Or you're feeling like you're unable to meet the need before you or unable to make the necessary changes that need to be made? If you're in that situation, then right now you are poor in spirit. Uh, here is a picture of uh, the UK, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and Northern Ireland. And in the very northwest of S Scotland, there is an island called the Isle of Lewis. You see the arrow on the map. And then next to that, within the island of Lewis, uh, these are called the Outer Hebrides. Uh, there's a small place called Barvas. And I'm going to tell you about Barvas now. In 1949, the local church body issued a proclamation to be read on a certain Sunday in all the free churches on the island of Lewis. That was a particular church movement. The proclamation called the people to consider, quote, the low state of vital religion throughout the land and the present dispensation of God's displeasure due to growing carelessness toward public worship and the growing influence of the spirit of pleasure, which has taken growing hold of the younger generation. This issue to the churches on the island uh, called on the churches to, quote, take these matters to heart and to make serious inquiry what must be the end if there is no repentance. We call upon every individual as before God to examine his or her life in the light of that responsibility which attends to us all and that happily in the divine mercy we may be visited with the spirit of repentance and turn again to the Lord whom we have so grieved, end of quote. In this parish, uh, this, this area of Barvas, a number of men and women took this to heart, especially two elderly women. They were two sisters aged 82 and 84 years old. The latter was blind. They gave themselves to waiting upon God on their little cottage and sought God in prayer. One night during uh, a time of prayer, I think it was, God gave one of the sisters a vision. In this vision, she saw the churches crowded with young people and she told her sister, I believe revival is coming to the parish. Revival is when God so visits 
a geographical location that the air is thick with his presence and, and people encounter God all over the place and miracles happen and people come back to God and healings happen and it's just the most extraordinary and incredible thing. So this one sister says to the other, based on this vision, I believe revival is coming to Barvis. Now at that time there was not a single young person attending public worship a fact which cannot be disputed. And so she sent for her pastor, her minister. She told him the story and he took her message as a word from God to him. And so he said, what do you think we should do? She said, give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to waiting upon God. Get your elders and deacons, get your leaders together and spend at least two nights per week waiting upon God in prayer. If you will do this at your end of, of the parish, this geographical area, then my sister and I will do it at our end of the parish from about 10 o'clock in, in, in the evening until 2 or 3 in the morning. That is hardcore, but they were hungry because they recognized they were poor in spirit. The state of the spiritual life of where they lived was, was poor, it was poverty, and they were embracing their poverty of spirit. So this pastor called his leaders together, and for several months they waited upon God in a barn among the straw. During this time, they, they were praying this one promise from Isaiah 44 verse 3, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your seed, and my blessing upon your offspring. And this went on for about three months, and during that time, other than the prayer, nothing seemed to happen. Well, when I was 17 years old, during that time where I was feeling that inner kind of emptiness and lack of peace and discontentment, uh, there was a process by which God made me realize that the only way that I could be fulfilled on the in inside, the only way I could experience lasting peace, lasting contentment, lasting joy and purpose was by being a follower of Jesus. And so one particular night in January in 1997, I knelt beside my bed and I prayed a prayer and I talked to God and I said, God, what I was doing, it wasn't working. But, and I recognize I need to follow you, Jesus. So I turn away from every other way of living and I commit to living your way from now on. And then I went to sleep. The following morning, I, I, I had this incredible dream overnight, uh, which is not common for me, uh, which I believe it was a dream from God. And I've had very few of those in my life. But I woke up with such a sense of being filled with joy, being filled with this spirit. I woke up in about an hour before my alarm clock, which at that time in my life as a 17 year old, that never, I mean, that was a miracle if it wasn't that evidence. But honestly, I just felt so filled with joy, so filled with the spirit. I was kind of marching up and down my bedroom, you know, just like oh, praising God as loud as I could. But I couldn't be loud because my parents were in the floor below. And if I was too loud, I would have woken them up. And there was just this overwhelming sense of joy and gratitude and the sense that God was present. Blessed are those who pour in, pour in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I experienced a little bit of the kingdom of heaven that morning. Blessed are those who mourn, as I did over my spiritual state, for they will be comforted. I experienced comfort that morning. Now, it's interesting that there's the blesseds of Matthew 5 up to verse 12. There's a lot of blessedness and blessedness and blessedness. But blessed are the poor in spirit is the first one. And that's why it's the secret to the blessed life. All the others are important. All the others come later. But this one comes first. Why? The uh, famous Welsh preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said, There is no one in the kingdom of heaven who is not poor in spirit. It is the fundamental characteristic of the Christian and of the citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And all other characteristics are, in a sense, a result of this one. In other words, this one must come first. There's no other entry into the Christian life other than recognizing your poor in spirit and throwing yourself on the mercy of God. So poor in spirit refers to an emptying. And you can't be filled with God's spirit unless you're first empty. Conviction must precede conversion. Sharing in Jesus' death comes before sharing in Jesus' resurrected life. 
And what's interesting is, is this poverty of spirit. It's very, very opposite. It's very different to the message you hear from our culture today. Our culture encourages independence. It encourages self-reliance, self-confidence, self-assurance, even self-assertion and self-sufficiency. But Lloyd-Jones again, he says, poor in spirit means a complete absence of pride, a complete absence of self-assurance and of self-reliance. What's interesting is being poor in spirit is not just the entry level in to the Christian life. It's also the key to growing in the Christian life. In other words, you never graduate from being poor in spirit. You never get beyond that place. And that requires a bit of explanation. I'll get there in a bit. When you read the Gospels, and if you haven't read the Gospels, you just wipe your schedule, find a space. You've just got to do it. The Gospels are amazing. Pick one. I think Matthew is probably my favorite, but if time's tight, Mark's the shortest, or if you're more philosophical, maybe go with John. But either way, pick one of the Gospels and read it because they're amazing. And through the Gospels, God reveals what he's actually like in the person of Jesus walking and talking and doing miracles and teaching and interacting with people. You actually see what God is like. It is mind-blowing. Got to read the Gospels. In the Gospels, there's one personality that stands out quite clearly as someone who is quite independent, someone who is quite self-reliant, self-confident, self-assured, and self-sufficient. And that person is Peter. He has yet to be broken by the cross of Jesus. He has yet to realize his own inadequacy before God. He's still living in the delusion, in the illusion that he is uh, adequate before God. And you see some of this happening in Luke chapter 5. Let me read it to you. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding round him, listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, who was later renamed Peter. Simon Peter, same person. He got into one of the boats belonging to Simon Peter and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said, Simon, put out, as in move the boat, into deep water and let down the nets for a catch for fish. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. And it's kind of like Peter saying, Jesus, you're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. Guess who knows more about fishing here? And even more, we've done it. And there's, there's just, they're not, the fish are not biting today. They're just, they're not there to be had yet. We've tried that patch. It ain't going to work, Jesus. That's what Peter's saying. In other words, he's trying to say, Jesus, I think I know a bit more than you about this one, eh? But I love Peter. He then says, but because you say so, Jesus, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boat so full that they began to sink. In other words, the catch was utterly overwhelming, completely supernatural. For a fisherman who knows the lake, he knows the conditions. He'd just been out earlier. He knows what a normal catch is. He knows what an extraordinary catch is. And this is something else. This is beyond even that. And so verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. There's something about being encountered by Jesus. And when you're encountered by him, you realize your own insufficiency. You realize your own inadequacy. You realize your own spiritual poverty. And Peter, this confident guy, when encountered by Jesus, was sort of unmasked, unveiled before him and realized, oh gosh, Lord, I need you. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So those who are poor in spirit are blessed, and then they're given full spiritual wealth, the kingdom of God. Theirs is every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, you might be kind of thinking, okay, how does this relate to me? Well, let me ask you some questions. As you're listening to this, are you thinking to yourself, I'm okay, I'm self-reliant, I'm self-sufficient, I don't need God, I'm, I'm doing all right. Well, those who think they are spiritually wealthy remain poor. But the Bible says that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. 
I'm going to ask you a number of questions in relation to some Bible verses I'm about to read to you. And as I ask, uh, read these verses, I want you to think in your mind, am I I'm good or is it I need help? Is your response I'm good or I need help? And the first three are going to come from the Sermon on the Mount, this portion of scripture from Matthew 5, 6 and 7. Then I'm going to read some other verses from elsewhere. But again, in your mind, I'm good or I need help. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. I'm good or I need help. Forgive those who hurt you. I'm good or I need help. Love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. I'm good or I need help. God says a number of times in the Bible, be holy for I am holy. I'm good or I need help. The Bible says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I'm good or I need help. Heal the sick. I'm good or I need help to do that. Prophesy accurately over people's lives and situations and futures. I'm good or I need help. The Bible says, Colossians 1.10, that we are to live a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing him in every way. Do you need assistance to live a life worthy of the fact that the eternal, perfect, beautiful, holy, majestic, glorious Son of God came down to, to earth as a human being to die upon a cross, an excruciating death, an incredibly painful death for your sins and mine. And in, in the light of that, we are to live a life worthy of him, worthy of the Lord and pleasing him in every way. In relation to that, are you good? Or do you need some help? Are you spiritually wealthy? Or have I hopefully shown you by a number of scriptures and I could have shown you more that actually we aren't good. We aren't self-sufficient. We aren't self-reliant. We all need help from the Lord. An old pastor of mine uh, in Scotland in the church I used to go to, um, he uh, used to say this and it always kind of confused me. But he often said, um, the closer to God I get, the worse I feel. And he would say it in a beautiful Scottish accent, so it sounded far nicer than that. But what he was saying was still pretty full on. The closer to God I get, the worse I feel. What? Why would you be a Christian if that's the case? And, and so I think some of what he's saying is not true. Like God fills me with joy and peace and encouragement. I get close to God, I feel all kinds of wonderful things. But there's something to what he's saying. There is a truth to what he is saying. And it's this. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah describes uh, a vision that he has. Isaiah is a prophet. That means someone who stands in the council of God, someone who actually dialogues with God, hears from God, uh, stands in the presence of God. And so during one of these times, Isaiah the prophet is standing before God. He's given this vision and he sees the glory of God filling the temple. And he's, he's just beholding this. Wow, he can actually see God in his beauty and majesty and splendor. And Isaiah's response is to say, I am in trouble. I am inadequate. I am weak. I am sinful. Woe is me. I am unclean. I, I have unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And now I have just seen the pure and holy one. Ah, <laughs> that's what Isaiah is saying. And I think that's what my old pastor was referring to. What I'm trying to say is this, is that when we get close to God, when God draws near to us, when we get an insight into his splendor and his beauty and his perfection and his holiness, we realize our own unholiness. We realize our own imperfections and our eyes are opened. You know, we don't suddenly become unholy. We already are. It's just we don't see it most of the time. But God, in his light, we see light. When we draw near to him, we see things we didn't see before. And can I submit to you that what Isaiah experienced in Isaiah chapter 6 is actually true of you and me all of the time. It's just we're oblivious to it most of the time. A pastor and a theologian and an author that I like is Tim Keller. And he says this, you are more sinful than you could ever dare imagine and you are more loved than you could ever dare hope at the same time. And it's true. It's just we're not aware of it all of the time, but it's true. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones again, he says the way to become poor in spirit is to look at God, look at him. And in his light, we see light, we see clearly. 
You see, before the all-powerful God, we are not competent. Before the all-holy God, our sinful motives and mindsets are revealed. Before the all-knowing God, our limited knowledge and understanding become apparent. Before the urgent and pressing and countless needs of our world, our inability to meet those needs becomes obvious. The need for prophetic insight, the need for physical healing, the need for breakthrough in life circumstances, the need for divine wisdom in difficult situations, the need for our city and our nation to turn back to God. All of these things are needed and none of them are within my capacity to deliver and none of them are within your capacity to deliver. We are poor in spirit, but the good news is blessed are those who are poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, even the Lord Jesus himself was dependent and reliant upon his father. John 5, 19, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, the son, referring to himself, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. And when you look at Jesus's prayer life, you realize that the hours he spent in prayer reveals his poverty of spirit. To be spiritually mature is to be dependent because you are living out of God's resources rather than your own. Are you dependent on God's resources? Are you dependent on God's grace? Being dependent on God's grace is essential to entering into the Christian life, but it's equally essential to growing in the Christian life. We enter in by grace, justification. We grow by grace, sanctification. A friend of mine a number of years ago um, told me the story. He, was, he got a new job. Uh, it was a job he'd never done before. And he didn't know what he was doing. And so what he would do is he would phone his predecessor, the guy who was in the job before him. And he'd phone him up about once a week and, and say, look, this is what's going on. This is the situation. I've no idea what to do. I'm out of my depth. What do I do? And his predecessor would tell him what to do. And he'd do it, and it would work out pretty good. And then the following week, he would do it again. A different situation. He phones, he gets the advice, he does it, and so on. This goes on for about a year. And after about a year, they meet up, the, the guy who's new to the role and his predecessor. And the guy who's new to the role, who's been in the role for a year, says to his predecessor, I feel like a complete fraud. You know, I don't really know what I'm doing. And, and, and you know, every time, I, I'm not sure what to do. I just phone you, you tell me what to do, and I do it. And the, his predecessor said, yeah. That's right. That is what you do. And that's why you're so good at your job. In other words, he recognizes his inability, his insufficiency, and he calls for help. He asks the right person for help, receives the help, acts upon it, and therefore grows in wisdom and does a great job. You see, we need to recognize our own inability before God to their, our own spiritual poverty in order to then turn to him, for him to then supply all of our needs. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones again, we have to be poor in spirit before we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, the neg negative before the positive. As we embrace our spiritual poverty, what does that lead to? It leads to receiving God's kingdom. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In receiving the kingdom of heaven, we receive eternal salvation. We, we, we receive adoption into God's family, an everlasting relationship with God. That's ours. Do you want to receive the kingdom of heaven? In receiving the kingdom of heaven, we receive kingdom privileges and kingdom authority. The powers of the kingdom of heaven are available to its citizens. We gain authority for miracles. Do you want the kingdom of heaven? Peter received a miraculous catch of fish so big that he had to call other people in to come and help to bring the catch in. In receiving the kingdom of heaven, we receive more than enough. And so there's plenty to go around for others to benefit as well. Do you want the kingdom of heaven? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. In Barvis on the island of Lewis, for months they had been waiting on God and praying. And in the natural, it appeared nothing was happening. Nothing happened until one night a young man had a Bible in his hand and he began reading Psalm 24. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He then shut his Bible and he looked at his companions and he said, Brothers, it seems to me so much nonsense waiting as we are unless we are rightly related to God. 
And I must ask myself, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And he started to recognise his own poverty of spirit because his heart wasn't pure. Maybe your heart isn't pure. Maybe my heart isn't pure. I know part of my heart definitely isn't. He then began to pray. At that moment, something happened in the barn and there was a power, the power of God, the supernatural power of God was let loose from that barn and it shook that whole area and visited the whole island of Lewis and God moved into that island. And the stories that came out of that revival, this was the last revival that the United Kingdom, Great Britain has experienced. Uh, they ex experienced many revivals. This is the last one most recently, historically. I've had the privilege of meeting two people who experienced that revival firsthand in the late 1940s. The stories that came out of that powerful move of God are extraordinary. The one story that I'll mention briefly is there was a reporter who traveled up from Glasgow, which is a long way in the south, traveled up to the Isle of Lewis to, to investigate what was going on. They'd heard these stories heard these rumours that Gold was doing these things and as a critical investigative, investigative journalist they wanted to find out what was going on. So they got a boat across to the island of Lewis and, and, and the story goes when the reporter stepped off the boat onto the island they literally they encountered the power of God and immediately fell down on their knees before God and they realised God is in this place. Lord do it again. Blessed of the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want the kingdom of heaven for my city. I want it for my nation. I want it for my family. I want it for my church. I want it for my friends. I want it for everyone I know, and I'm sure you do too. Have you embraced your poverty of spirit? The poor in spirit are those who are empty before God. Embrace this truth. Recognize your total dependence on him, your utter need for him. Do that and the kingdom of heaven will be yours for eternity and for here and now. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we are poor in spirit, but we often don't realize it. We often live oblivious to that truth, thinking that we're okay, we're fine. Because Lord, we're using wrong standards to measure how we're doing. Lord, you call us to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. You call us to be holy. You call us to, to love our enemies. You call us to, to live a life worthy of the calling we've received. You call us to do many things, to heal the sick and to make disciples. And Lord, you call us to do so many things that we can't do. And we are indeed poor in spirit. We need you. Lord, would you draw near? Would you unmask? Lord, would you remove the scales from our eyes so we may see clearly? Not only our own poverty of spirit before you, but also, Lord, we want to see you in your beauty, in your holiness, in your splendor. And Lord, as we do, Lord, we'll see ourselves as we truly are. We'll recognize our need for you. We'll throw ourselves at your mercy. And Lord, you'll lead us forward. And so, Lord, lead us into, into this lived reality of embracing our poverty of spirit. And we thank you that as we do, the kingdom of heaven will be ours. And there's more than enough to go around. And Lord, where we have lived a life with you at a distance, you, you, you've, you've, we've known about you, we've done lip service to you, but we haven't really followed you. Lord, that time is over. We turn away from that now. We turn away from our life of leaving you at arm's length. And instead we commit to following you from this point forward. Lord, I confess, Lord God, that we confess that we have sinned, that we, are, that we are not worthy, Lord God, to be called your children. But Jesus, we recognize you died for us. You died to deal with every sin that we've ever done, past, present, and future. And Lord, you then, by your spirit, adopt us into your family. Lord, and though we're not worthy, we can now call you Father. And so, Lord, we receive the gift of salvation. We receive the gift of forgiveness, the gift of eternal life from Jesus. We thank you. We're adopted into your family. Would you fill us with your spirit and help us to live for you, Jesus, from this point forward. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
For I once was lost, but now I'm found Was blind, but now I see Hallelujah And Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah And Christ is risen from the grave Welcomed on the sinner now I say For the God who died came back to life And everything has changed Hallelujah And Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah And Christ is risen from the grave Oh death where is your sin Skies, your open arms, the beauty of your face. And through tears of joy, I'll lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sin? Oh, fear, where is your power?
We worship God by the whole lives, and that includes our finances. We don't give out of compulsion or to earn God's favor. We already, in Jesus, we already have God's favor. And so we give as a part of our worship, our response of love to him. And so this is your opportunity to give this morning. Uh, if you want more details, you can give via our website at elamdeneden.com forward slash giving. What do you think is the next step that God is calling you to? We're only responsible for the next step uh, in following Christ on this journey. Could it be to um, get more get more involved in your church community? Could it be joining a small group? Could it be actually coming to an in-person service? Maybe it looks like uh, you taking your step of faith on a, on another step in that journey. Maybe it's being more committed to, to meeting with others or meeting with Jesus or reading your Bible. What does it look like for you to take another step towards God on your journey of faith? And now we'll leave you with a blessing. Fakanuia te ngo te atua ki ngā tuarangi, fakamoi mititia, fakapaingia mo ake tonu atu. Amen.